anyone found out, I'd never work again. The gay and lesbian lifestyle is not natural or normal, and it never will be. From a barge on the Seine to the clandestine nightclubs of 1980s England to the ornate palaces of Algeria's first ever costume drama, we'll be visiting all of those places in this week's film show. To tell us about some of this week's notable releases, I'm joined by one of our film critics, Ben Kroll. Ben, hello. Hello. Now, Ben, our first film keeps us here in Paris. It's a look at an unconventional mental health facility. Nicolas Philibert's On the Adamant won the Golden Bear at this year's Berlin Film Festival a pretty rare honor for a documentary film. Tell us, Ben, what makes this one so special? Uh, certainly it's care and, and it's compassion. You know, documentaries often invite us to re-examine our own world, to see familiar sights through an unfamiliar lens. And Nicolas Philibert does exactly that with On the Adamant. The film takes us onto a barge floating in the sand, in the center of Paris, where mental care, pat uh, mental care patients are able to participate in a series of artistic workshops. The film is very... Uh, unshowy and observational as it just follows these po follows these patients, follows these workshops, um, and, and it's really about the creative process. All right, well, let's take a look at daily life in On the Adamant. Sur ce, je prends un traitement très fort que, que, que je désire pas, que je peux dire un dialogue avec vous, Guillaume. Sinon, sinon, je me prends projet dessus, moi. Bah, C'est bloqué dans la tête, toujours les mêmes délires, les mêmes choses. Personne n'est parfait. Alors, je m'appelle Sabine Berlière, je suis psychiatre. Hein, je serais contente à votre place. Ben, je, alors, et j'y viens. Ben, je voulais vous dire que je suis très contente d'arriver sur le bateau. Now, a lot of documentaries follow a set of characters or have sort of a central narrative. Does this film do that? Not really, and that's part of the game. Uh, you know, Philippe replicates the actual experience of going to this drop-in clinic that run by the city of Paris. Uh, you know, it's run by the city. It has nine to five hours. So the film follows that same pattern. It doesn't follow the patient's home. It's not about the difficulties of living with mental illness. It's not about the bureaucratic administration of, like, running such a facility. It's more of a low-key, uh, lightly structured hangout film. You engage with the different patients here or there. You follow a, a series of different workshops. You see people come back, you know, at the beginning, towards the end. But for the most part, it's about the process itself, where these um, patients are able to channel, like, the frustrations of living uh, with a kind of debilitating mental illness into, into creative expression, into photography, into painting, into song. And, uh, you know, when the film won the Golden Bear in Venice, the, this year's jury president, Kristen Stewart, called it a cinematic proof of the vital necessity of human expression. And I think, you know, who said it better than her. Yeah, it definitely sounds like a lovely way to spend a couple of hours. And Ben, this comes as documentaries are actually having a bit of a moment and they've been winning more and more of these big prizes. Well, yeah, of course. I mean, um, you know, Laura Partress's uh, All the Beauty and the Bloodshed won the Golden Lion in Venice. Uh, Philibert's uh, On the Adamant just won the Golden Bear in Berlin. And next month, two documentaries, Youth from director Chinese, uh, from Chinese director Wang Bing and Four Daughters from Tunisian director Kautar Benhana, Benhania uh, are going to compete for the Palme d'Or. The, the last time two documentaries competed for the, Palme, for the Palme d'Or was 19 years ago, and that year the documentary won. That was Michael Moore's Fahrenheit 9-11. So, hey, we could be looking at a full festival sweep as well. All right, we'll be keeping an eye on those documentaries at can. What do you think is behind this sort of documentary renaissance? I think streaming has a lot to do with it. I mean, documentaries are really some of the most popular popular titles on streaming platforms and that's given and that's kind of taken them out of the ghetto. Audiences now watch documentaries as easily as they do uh, films or series and film festival programmers and now film festival juries are kind of playing catch up. Of course, they are catching up because the artistry and the uh, you know sophistication of documentary has always been there. And this next film is not a documentary, but it does show what it might have been like to be gay in 1980s Britain. Let's take a look at Blue Jean. I'm bullying a second for her just because I don't parade my sexuality around like a badge of honour. How was that girl ever going to learn that she has a place in this world? Maurice, she thinks she has a place in this world. You're the one with the problem, not me. This isn't a game, Lois. It's me life. She reminded me a bit of you, you know. A deer in the headlights. I'm not a deer in the headlights, am I? Sometimes. I'm damaged. And in a way, you're not. At least you don't have to be. If I don't have to be, then why do you? Now, 
Ben, I know you were really taken with this film. What drew you in? Uh, just about everything. This is a really powerful drama about a queer life under Margaret Thatcher's England. It follows a closeted high school teacher torn between the hard-won freedoms of her personal life and the repressive social climate that forces her to keep so much of that joy a secret. It's also a very acute character study. Uh, lead actor Rosie McEwen is fantastic, plays Jean. Uh, she's kind of a half-coward, overwhelmed by a sea of anti-gay rhetoric, and that pushes her to a series of like, morally questionable stances, especially when confronted with a new student who is more overt in her own sexuality. Um, the film argues that living such a double life uh, can carry a terrible psychological toll, uh, and that makes it really relevant to the here and now. And visually, the film has a very vintage quality to it. It almost looks like it was actually made in the 80s. Yeah, the 80s. director Georgia Oakley used like a very evocative 16 millimeter film stock, uh, and that limbs the film that throwback quality that you're talking about. It it feels like something pulled from 1988, only with a more sexually frank and often a liberatory approach that really wouldn't have been shot in that same way and funded by the same social institutions back then. It, it uses an older film language to honor the stories that really weren't made at the time. All right, Ben, our next release takes us all the way back to the 16th century. Director Adila Bendimarad and Damian Unouri's The Last Queen tells the true story of Algeria's fallen monarchy. Well, let's say true with a little asterisk, because uh, the film was inspired by the legend of Princess Zafira, a uh, mythical figure whose historical provenance is still a matter of debate. A and that's kind of the point. This uh, cautious costume drama wants to explore the personal stories left out of the great man narratives of history. And then we're going to take a look. And Ben, is it true that this is the first ever Algerian costume drama? Oh yeah, totally. I mean, it is in many ways like a, a very classical film. It's like a historical pageant about a glamorous queen, her two warrior suitors, and uh, spoiler alert, her tragic end. <laughs> Listen, it goes the way you'd expect. Um, but. At the same time, it's almost a, in a really revolutionary project because this is the first costume epic, this is the first historical drama made in Algeria. Uh, and it is a passion project for directors Adila Bendimarad and Damien Unouri. They spent more than a decade putting the film together uh, and creating the very infrastructure to make a costume drama. And not only did they have to get the sets ready, they don't have to get all of the costumes made, they also had to get European backing. And that was harder than they expected because the film is set in the 16th century, way before any kind of colonial presence was there. And there was the sense that it was deviating from the conventional narratives about what Algeria could be on screen. This is a film that throws, you know, that, that casts off like the, the conventional wisdom about how Algeria should be depicted to honor like Algerian culture, Algerian history in a new and, um, and quite moving way. Yeah, sounds revolutionary and also epic. Uh, it looks quite good. It's old school and revolutionary. Yeah. Two great tastes that taste great together. Definitely one to check out. All right, Ben, we're going to close today with a movie that's being called The Greatest Film of All Time by a group of international critics. Uh, it has quite a long name. Jeanne Dillman, 23, Quai du Commerce, uh, 1080, Brussels. And that's a real address. That's a real Google address. It. It's her address <laughs> in the film. And now this is from Belgian director uh, Chantal Ackerman. It's being re-released in France this week. Ben, best film ever, according to... To who? According to Sight and Sound magazine, which takes a uh, poll every 10 years of film critics, curators, academics, and filmmakers, um, for the past, uh, they've done it every 10 years since 1952. Uh, for the past 70 dec uh, for the past uh, 70 years, past seven decades, basically two films have topped that poll: Vertigo from Alfred Hitchcock and Citizen Kane from Orson Welles. This year, there was a surprise. Number one, it was Jean Dillman from Chantal Ackerman. Uh, some felt that it was a, you know, that it may have dethroned like these classic uh, choices, but I think that it's a very worthy companion, and I think it's a very worthy film to carry that title of greatest film of all time. Yeah, we've all heard of the other ones, and so it also kind of introduces a film many of us haven't heard of. I myself hadn't, have to admit, I hadn't seen it. What struck me from the trailer, though, is all of these kind of the pleasure of these little sounds from daily life. Is it worth going to see in the cinema? Oh, absolutely, and in fact, it's a thing. It's a film that sort of needs to be seen in the cinema. It's if I have to say, the film is 
named the best film of all time because it is a film that really engages with the art form of cinema. This is a three and a half hour long um, uh, epic about domestic life, about the repetition of tasks. It tells you how to watch it. It creates a pattern that it then gradually breaks. And so to see it in a cinema, really is to engage with a film uh, about daily life without the uh, distractions of our own daily life. It's, 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 it's a massive big screen film about the smallest minutia of life. That being said, there's sex, there's violence, uh, but when that violence happens and when the sex sort of happens, um, it becomes all the more powerful because it's anchored in this immersive experience of, 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 of living, of, of the passage of time. Yeah, and maybe we're not expecting it. All right, we'll leave our viewers with a taste of the rhythm of daily life in Jen Dielman. Ben, thank you so much as always. Thanks to all of you for watching. For more culture, you can always head to our website or find us on social media. And there is more news coming up on France 24 right after this. Liberté, égalité, actualité.